Justin Cranston, director of the North Dakota Pipeline Authority. All right, and uh, thank you for joining us here. Kind of looking to get an update and a year in review, if you will, kind of the end of the year thing here. Um, I know that a lot of annual meetings are going on, of course, at the Petroleum Council meeting. Kind of some big news came out about the future of the Bakken. and we'll get to that in just a second. But the last um, kind of director's cut, uh, my, my, my recollection is we have record highs in both crude oil and natural gas. Is that right? Correct. And so uh, this summer, as the industry worked its way through the, through the downturn and through the winter months and, and coming into the summertime, uh, we have seen production start rising, not only for crude oil, but natural gas as well. Natural gas liquids associated with that. Um, so all three of those commodity streams are at all-time highs. And, and uh, from my perspective, having a look at the marketing of those products and, and how do those uh, commodities get to consumers around the, the U.S.? So let's talk about that. I wanted to ask you about, you know, the, the record portion of it. You know, we're not talking, you know, oil prices are good, but they've been better. Are, are they shaving money at the rigs? You know what I mean? Saving money, I call it shaving money. Um, or is there, you know, more rail happening to take it away? I guess, is there anything that's kind of leading the charge for us to get a record production? Well, I think a combination of a few things taking place. First, the, the price levels today um, are, are more than adequate to get uh, industry interested in, in not only the core portion of the Bakken, but now working their way outside of that core. And so during the downturn, everyone saw uh, the industry condense. Uh, rigs were, were laid down, and, but the remaining rigs were all concentrated in that core area of the play. Um, as prices started to return to uh, higher levels that we've seen here in 2018, the industry not only continued to stay very, very active in that core area, but as well uh, moved outside of the core. So we're seeing more activity, in, say, in Williams County, uh, northern Montreal County, uh, and, and areas that hadn't seen much interest for several years. And along with the pricing, the, the second major factor that led to North Dakota to be in the position it's in is the, the technology changes. Um, I can't emphasize that enough uh, to your listeners that the technology that, that's been developed over the last several years continues to um, astound just about everyone. Uh, these wells that are getting drilled today are, are significantly better than they were, say, five years or, or more ago. And so it, it takes less well completions to have uh, quicker rates of, of production growth in, in the area. And so all those things coming together uh, are leading to what's expected to be continued growth for, for many years. Well, I think that technology side is really exciting. You know, I mean, it brings in a whole new world of refracts. And the more, what, what are we at, about a 10% of uh, understanding of the Bakken? Is that the number I saw last time? Uh, a more consistent number now is typically about 12 to 15% is, is what the industry believes that they can uh capture with today's technology uh, okay with the tighter well spacing and the their well completions um 12 to 15 is a pretty fair number today whereas you, several years ago just the single digits of percentages and five percent or less were some of the earlier beliefs um, when this play really got going almost 10 years ago well and it's really exciting too because it adds a new layer of uh, job opportunity for those uh kind of the white collar jobs if you will the figure out that technology to make it so it's more efficient in order to do the fracking. And um, it's exciting. If, for me, it is. I don't know. I, I, th I think it's pretty cool. I, the oil and gas industry really excites me. But um, talk to me about how they're getting it away from the wells now. You know, we've got pipeline. We've got rail. We have trucks. I tell you, I was in Fargo the other day and had to wait at a, at a train train uh, light for about 20 minutes because it looked like they're at max capacity now for a lot of the crude oil um, BNSF tr tankers. So are, are we seeing a pretty good increase in rail? Or I, I'm sure the pipelines are max. They've been max for a while. Yeah, so, so getting that, so if we talk just crude oil now and how that's getting to market. And so um, the oil that's being produced, majority is still leaving the region by pipeline when we look at just a pure market share, you know, about 71% is moving out by pipe. Uh, the remainder is either being refined locally, which is a much smaller percentage, around 5 or 6%. And then uh, roughly a fifth or 20% is 
is going out on the rail cars. And so um, while the percentages have been increasing, uh, along with that, the, the volumes have been increasing. So uh, nowhere near the peak amount of, of rail traffic for crew by rail that we saw, say, back in the 2013, 2014 type of time frame when at its peak, North Dakota was moving over 800,000. Uh, barrels of oil per day by rail car. The numbers are much smaller today, but they are growing. And so now estimates are right around 275,000 uh, some odd barrels per month leaving by rail car. Um, and that number is expected to continue uh, to grow. Uh, one of the, the more immediate challenges for the industry right now on crude oil is that my expectations are that by early next year, uh, the production levels uh, within the, the U.S. portion of the Williston Basin will exceed pipeline capacity again. And so the, the industry will, is today electively using uh, crude by rail because uh, there's some market advantages to doing so. Um, but very soon, the industry will move out of that elective scenario into uh, market forces uh, driving any excess production onto the rail networks. Uh, we'll transition into natural gas because uh, I, I saw quite a few articles on One Oak and the investment they're putting into the pipeline and, I guess, ga uh, ga gas gathering, if you will. Uh, where, where are we at with the natural gas in terms of, you know, shipping it to market? Yeah, so natural gas has, has a number of, of challenges associated with it. So uh, for folks that aren't familiar with the natural gas from the Bakken and Three Forks system comes up with the crude oil. So it's produced together. It's not something that industry can, they can't produce the crude oil without the natural gas. And so that natural gas, as it comes up, needs to be handled appropriately and marketed um, in the most efficient manner. And so in North Dakota, Everyone's familiar with the challenges that the industry has had with gas capture and making sure that as much of that gas goes into the sale pipelines as opposed to the flare pits. Um, when we look at what was taking place this summer, uh, about 18% of the gas was being flared in the month of, of July, which is the most recent we have. And so the root causes for that flaring is several things have to be in place in order to have a complete gas capture system. The gas gathering, so the small network of pipelines out in the field themselves, those have to be adequately sized um, and in the right location. And they, their job is to move that gas from the wellhead to one of the processing facilities in the state. And so the next phase that, that needs to be in place is having adequate plant capacity. So, um, having the facilities that can take that natural gas in its raw form from the from the wellheads, clean it up into the various components that you and I use as consumers. And then the third phase is the long haul transmission. So moving either the dry, the methane gas to communities like Bismarck, Fargo, Minot, um, or moving the natural gas liquids from those gas plants, the propanes, butanes, um, those other commodity streams. And so right now, uh, the most pressing issue in North Dakota is on the localized, the gathering infrastructure and the processing infrastructure. And so some of the industry reactions to that, uh, there are eight projects over the next roughly year and a half that are, are scheduled to, to come online uh, that will add about 1.1 billion cubic feet of additional gas processing plant and gathering capacity in the region. So. Uh, it's it's been a challenging uh, number of months as the industry has ramped up here this summer. Uh, some relief will start coming into play, hopefully within the next uh, several weeks, as one of the first plants is, is scheduled to come online. Uh, when we look at all that investment from a dollar perspective, uh, roughly about 1.7 billion dollars just on gathering and processing uh, slated to come online here in the next year and a half. So. Uh, substantial reaction from the industry to, to, to help address this challenge. Again, it, it's something that has always been challenging for North Dakota. That, that the real root cause, again, is that the, the well, the technology are performing much better than the systems that were originally designed uh, to handle. So the, the engineers and the, the pipeline companies, the systems they built with all the best intentions and knowledge base have an appropriately sized system technology uh, pushed the envelope uh, much faster than anyone anticipated. So production was coming out at much higher volumes uh, than those systems were, were capable of handling. 
And so we're in a, a situation now of expansion and, and new builds, and we expect that to continue for many years to come. That's going to make quite a dent, uh, isn't one like One Oaks um, pipeline that they're putting in there? Is it, is is that going to allow for more uh, crude oil to be shipped out? Because I kind of see where that you know that flaring uh, edict, if you will, by the Industrial Commission kind of is a checks and balance on how much crude oil can be pumped out of the Bakken on a daily basis. You know, the governor wants to go to two two million barrels. Well. You know, we got to get the natural gas side in order in order to make that happen. Is that is that a fair statement? It is fair that that you know, ensuring that the, the companies are are meeting the regulatory requirements, especially on the gas side, in order to continue to produce on uh, the oil side of the, the revenue stream. Which for the vodka and Three Forks, for the vast majority of the economics are, are made on the, the crude oil right. side of the play, and so. Um, so the companies do, however, need to continue to invest and make sure they're monetizing the remainder of that value and that natural gas stream. How about some of these science projects that, you know, these natural gas science projects, you know, there's a hundred of them out there and they, they all do good work, but, you know, the, sometimes the economics aren't there. Is is the increase in the um, crude oil, is that is that um, are these little science projects getting some work out there, helping these guys out? Because I do see when the pipelines are full, the pipelines are full. I mean, you can only do so much. So you got to get kind of inventive on ways to, you know, either ship it out by crude crude oil or get a little science project in order to get your natural gas side figured out. So do you know much about that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Some of these LNG guys and, you know, they, they produce yeah. diesel right on site or what, if you will. Yep, so there's a number of different, you know, typically I, I refer to them as the, the alternative technologies. They're, they're not the traditional gathering and processing that the industry is used to. It's an alternative method. Well, that's more of a, you know, that's more of a politically correct word than the little science projects, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's numerous different techniques that they're, they're using. They, they may uh, have different techniques of, of capturing the natural gas liquids on site. They may use it for the natural gas stream for power generation or compressed natural gas or liquefied natural gas. So, so many different projects and, and absolutely uh, those projects uh, are needed as much now as, as ever for the industry. And there's, I would say, a very high level of interest and expansion for those technologies because there are areas of the play that realistically um, the pipeline infrastructure will, will not be adequate for for quite some time and just because of the schedule of events uh, leading up to the, some of the expansions and uh, projects like those uh, are critical for some operators to continue to meet their their gas capture requirements um how about kind of just a, a year in review if you will um is there anything that stood out from your standpoint from the pipeline authority standpoint that you know we're kind of near and now and like you said a lot of annual meetings happening so i imagine you're probably doing some presentations at those but is, is there anything that kind of you know stands out to make you know 2018 the year of xyz well it, 2018 was the year that, that things started to, to definitely turn around for the industry it's been several years of, of low activity levels uh, lower uh, production levels and so 2018 was really the, the big turnaround year and uh, the growth has begun again, and with the price forecasts that are out there from various organizations, the expectations are that this growth is going to continue. You know, we've got typical North Dakota winter challenges, but the, the general trend is going to continue to be upwards for, for many years. And when I look at the transportation needs, every single sector will need pipeline expansion work, whether that's the natural gas and the, the local gathering, natural gas from a transmission, crude oil gathering, crude oil transmission, NGLs, every one of those product streams, when we look at the growth potential and, and infrastructure that's currently in place, is not going to be adequate. And so every one of those segments, we will continue to see investment and expansion going forward. Um, and so everyone um, that's part of this industry or watches this industry is going to continue to see those projects coming up um, as we uh, continue to move forward. Just kind of final thought here. I wanted to elaborate on what you said because I was having a conversation with someone the other day about this, and it kind of was a 5,000-foot view of what you just said, which is even during the downturn, we were doing a million barrels a day. I think we dipped under a million at one month, but for the most part, 
It was a million barrels a day. I mean, that's that's incredible at thirty dollars oil, and we were still doing that. Um, you look at the technology at twelve to fifteen percent. Continental came out and said, you know, another 20, 30, 40 years. That's what the state's been staying for a long time. So when I look at, you know, the 5,000 foot view and I see how, you know, the Davis refineries um, moving ahead on what they have going, One Oak, uh, there's always these proposed uh, pipelines in order to uh, move some more crude oil out there. The the reality of the situation is we've got a 15 to 30 year oil industry in North Dakota, don't we, Justin? Well, I would, I would go much further beyond that. And so um, when I look at uh, just recently this fall, I, I performed a study looking at the drilling inventory remaining and, and all types of, of questions associated with it. And just the drilling phase of, of the, the industry here in North Dakota has decades to come on just the initial drilling of the wells. And that does not include... The, the t- typical 30 to 40 year life of the well that does not include any type of longer term uh, end of life uh, recovery work such as enhanced oil recovery, refracts, you know, those other technologies that will be applied to these wells. So uh, many, many decades left uh, of this play, not only 